is Dr. Eric Holland from the University of Quebec at Montreal, who speak about automatic symbolic number theory. We are going to take Eric <coughs> for dinner and uh, six, at 6.45 at the usual place. If you'd like to join us, you're most welcome, but please let me know right after the talk. Thank you. Well, thanks for the invitation, and thanks very much for everybody for coming. Um, what I'm talking about is a, is a program that I've been working on, um, written in Mathematica, to perform automated simplification of expressions involving number theory type uh, functions. And so um, it's, it's, sort of, it's a very much a work in progress. It's sort of a hacky thing right now built to uh, solve one particular problem, which I'll talk about. So I really want to talk more about the context of what it is um, than the, the nitty gritty detail, because there are a lot of, of gritty detail. Um, and the term symbolic number theory is just my, my term for, for meaning uh, expressions in, you know, in, in variables. So we have, we have polynomials um, that, are, that are expressions in, in variables. Um, they're algebraic expressions, but we can, if we introduce different functions into those, we get different sort of expressions. So symbolic number theory is, is I was surprised to not find any Google hits searching for symbolic number theory, at least for math. There is one Google hit, which is a, a psychic blogger. <laughs> uh, so beyond, beyond empathy, if you, if you Google symbolic number theory, you'll find a, a blog about uh, metaphysics and, and something that I don't understand. Uh, but now but, you do. But in terms of a mathematics, yeah, in terms now of you do, right? now I do. Yeah. yeah. So so yeah, I have yet to email her and and make the connection between uh, predicting the future and, and mathematics. But uh, I'll do that. So so I, so to give some some context, I want to start with a a prologue to the talk, and this is about irregular sequences. So recall that uh, a sequence Sn, say index starting from zero, um, is called constant recursive, otherwise known as C finite. Uh, if it satisfies a linear recurrence with constant coefficients, linear recurrence with constant coefficients. And I'm going to say something else slightly strange, but you'll see what I'm saying in a second. Um, and what does this recurrence do? This recurrence relates two elements of the sequence. So S of M and S of N are related. when M and N are sufficiently close. Close in, you know, close in the normal sense of real numbers. All right, so for example, uh, T of N plus one equals two times T of N say with t of 0 being 1, right, now tn is 2 to the n, um, and, and, but this is, a, this is a recurrence specifying the sequence 2 to the n, um, where n and m are directly related by the recurrence if they're one apart. And something like the Fibonacci recurrence relates Two numbers to each, uh, relates two terms of the sequence to each other if they're within you know, distance two. Right. So, so my definition, which is going to be a little nebulous, uh, for a k regular sequence is the following: S n is k regular, so k is some integer, positive integer at least two. Uh, basically, well, I'm going to write the exact same thing. If S n satisfies a linear recurrence with constant coefficients, actually, I'm going to say satisfies linear recurrences with 
constant coefficients, where s and m, s of m and s of n are related. when n and m are not sufficiently close as real numbers, but are sufficiently close in base k. So what I mean is their base k representations are very similar. They agree, you know, most of the letters are the same, for example. Most of the digits are the same. All right, so what's an example of this? Let's let g of n be the number of odd binomial coefficients and choose i. So we're looking like at a row of Pascal's triangle and choose i, where i is between 0 and n. Uh, or we could say, of course, all i, because outside of that range, binomial coefficients are 0. Um, does anyone remember what this is equal to? Another way of writing this? So this was a resultant glacier in 1899. Do you mean n? Yeah, this is, this is n choose yeah. i. n choose i. So this is 2 to the number of 1s in the binary representation of n. And I'm going to denote base k representations by n in parentheses subscript k. So n in parentheses of 2 is a base 2 representation. Okay, so I claim that this is a two regular sequence, in fact. Um, and what are the recurrences that it satisfied? G of 2n, well, what does the base 2 representation of 2n look like with respect, with respect to the base 2 representation of n? Well, it just has an extra zero on the end. So it doesn't change the number of ones in the binary representation of n when we multiply by 2. So this is the same as g of n. And what about GM, uh, G of 2n plus 1? Well, this does change the number, but we just have to multiply Gn by 2. And I guess we need an initial condition. So G of 0 is uh, 1, I guess. Right, and so this, this is an example of this nebulous definition where two, two terms in the sequence g of n are related when their binary representations are similar. Right? 2n has a very similar binary representation to n. We just append a 0 at the end of n. And here, we're just appending a 1. OK, does this make sense? So let's look at one more example. Let's let t of n be the parity of the number of ones in the binary representation of n mod 2. So we're sort of taking the exponent there and reducing it mod 2. So maybe, maybe well, let me write out these, the first few terms here. So 0, we're start indexing from 0, so this is g of 0. So 0 has 0 ones in its binary res representation, so this is 2 to the 0. 1 has 1, 1. Uh, 2 has 1, 1. 3 has 2 ones, etc. And here, the first few terms are 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. And this is called the 2A Morse sequence. And 
this also satisfies some recurrences. So what's T of 2n? Well, again, multiplying by 2 doesn't change the number of 1, so this is equal to T of n. T of 2n plus 1. When we add a, when we stick a one on the, at the end of the binary representation of n, that flips the parity from either one to zero or zero to one. So we can write this, for example. Um, and we can consider we can consider this to be to satisfy this this definition. So it does relate to two terms when their binary representations are close. Um, but this is actually an inhomogeneous. Because this term doesn't have a, a t in it, this is a constant. Um, but just like you can homogenize uh, constant recursive recurs recurrences, you know, if I if I added a one here, and we want and we looked at this sequence, we could find another recur recurrence that is homogeneous that this recurrence satisfies. And you can do something similar here. So let me just write it out. So this is t of two n. But t of 4n plus 1 is t of 2n plus 1. t of 4n plus 3 is t of n. So why does this work? Well, because adding two ones at the end of the binary representation of n doesn't change the parity. And t of 0 is 0. All right, so this is this is sort of what a, this is what a general, uh, well, really over there is what a general k regular sequence looks like. So this is this is two regular. Both of these sequences are two regular. K being two because we're looking at the binary representation. So both of these are two regular. Uh, let me give you one more example. And that is relating to merge sort. So merge sort is a sorting algorithm where we're given a list of length n, and we're interested in, in sorting that list. And we want to know how many comparisons we have to make in order to sort the list. And the algorithm is, you, you have, so you have your list, uh, L, say, n, list of length n. And what you do is you break the list in half, and you sort the first half recursively using merge sort. You sort the second half recursively using merge sort. And then you, you sort of interleave them together. So then you look at the first element of, this sort of, of the sorted first half and see whether it's bigger or less than the first element of the second half. And so let's say, say the first one was, was smaller, so you put that one in there. And then you compare the next two elements, and then you sort of Sort the, sort the two halves and then merge them together. So the question is, how many comparisons do we have to make? So let's let m n be the number of comparisons for our list of length n. And well, we have to sort the first half. So m of n is however long, however many operations it takes to sort the first half. And of course, n may not be even, so let's stick a floor in here. And then we have to sort the second half. And then how many operations does it take to put them together? Well, we're going to end up with, with a list of length n. So for every position except for the last one, we'll have to have, have made some comparisons. So this is n minus 1. So this is sorting the first half, for sorting the second half, and then, and then we interweaving them together. Right. So this is this is a recurrence for this sequence. Uh, um, you know we need some initial conditions again. But what I have over here is also a recurrence for the sequence that shows that it's too regular if you if you believe it. Um, and this is, I wanted to write this example because it's a it's sort of the general the general case of, of what a too regular sequence looks like. Basically, it gives you a, a, a way to compute any term of the of the sequence by reducing it to to smaller index terms. So here, for example. No matter what our index is, modulo 8, one of these six equations is going to apply. 
So if our index is divisible by eight, we use this one, and we rewrite you know, some linear combination of, of these other indices. And the point is that the, the indices on the right-hand sides of all these equations, um, the biggest coefficient is four. So there's no coefficient eight or, or larger. I mean, coefficients are different. So this is all, this, we're always sort of you know, reducing, reducing the problem. And it's also much faster to compute than the finite. But logarithmic right. Uh, speed. Right. So, so for a C finite sequence, uh, if you want to compute f of 100, you have to know all the all the previous terms. Right. Here, if you want to compute the nth term, you know the number of operations required to sort a list of length 100. Um, every time you're chopping off a digit in base k, so it's an f logarithmic time, which must much faster to compute the term. So, this hides by that n is possible. Right. So it's, yeah, yeah. So right, right. So yeah. So you get you get different things. Yeah. It's it's not clear at all that M that, that M is is positive from this representation. Okay. So that's what a K regular sequence is. I mean, K regular sequences are are very analogous to constant recursive sequences. They have rational generating functions. If you look at the right generating function. Um, there's a matrix formulation, just like there is for, for constant recursive sequences. So they're, they're really analogous. Um, and, and they come up a lot in, in computer science-y things when you have you know, splitting and, and recursion of this, of this kind. Where you're, are, they, are they closed under multiplication? They're closed under term-wise multiplication and generating function multiplication. Yeah, so they have lots of nice closure properties. Um, you can guess. You know, if you suspect a sequence is k-regular, you can you can set up equations like this, and because because everything's linear, you can put in symbolic coefficients and guess. You know, so there's mansatz for it. So yeah, it's it's a very nice class of sequences, and it's it's not very well represented. So they were defined in 1992 um, by Jean-Paul Lelouch and Jeffrey Shalit. And they don't, they don't, they don't make such a big deal of this analogy. But, but the more I work with them, the more I, I'm thinking that this is a, this is a very important analogy to me. Okay, so that's the end of the prologue. Uh, how much time did I use up in, in the prologue? Okay. So, so the, what I want to talk about is the following question: What is the lexicographically Least word on some alphabet, say sigma, that avoids a pattern P. Okay, so let's do an example. So say we have an alphabet of two letters, zero and one, and P is a set of squares. So this is all words of the form WW. Uh, where we where we don't want to include the empty word. So some squares in English are like couscous. This is a game that Jeff Shaw likes to play. Couscous is a square. Uh, the the pro the neatest one I think is hots squared. Hot shots. Hot shots. Because it plays on this sh combining thing. Uh, Here's another one that I won't write out, uh, but there, there, there. You know, you can play this game, and there's there's several squares in English. So the question is, um, what's the lexicographically least word on two letters that avoids squares? And we can just you know, start generating um, a word and and see what happens. So so let's say the first, let's you know since we're looking for the lexicographically least, let's say the first letter is zero. And then, okay, well, what can the second letter be? Well, it can't be zero because zero, zero is a square. Can it be zero, one? So far, yeah. Um, okay, then we have a zero. Uh, and then, you know, so we basically always, always see if zero works. And if it doesn't, then we, then we try something else. Okay, zero doesn't work there because that's a square. Well, zero, one doesn't work either because zero, one, zero, one is a square. So now we have to backtrack. We say, well, something, something earlier was wrong. Right, so we can't, we, we've exhausted all the letters here, so maybe this zero wasn't right. So let's try a one there. Well, no, that doesn't work either. Um, okay, so now we have to backtrack all the way to the first zero uh, and change that to a one. 
And we can keep going, um, but, but basically here we see that, well, uh, if there's no square free word on, that starts with zero, there's not going to be any square free word that starts with one. So, so this, this actually doesn't exist. Do you want it to be an infinite word? Yeah, sorry, infinite word, yeah. I'm going to write that. Yeah, we want it to be an infinite word. Yeah, because otherwise, you know, zero. <laughs> zero yeah, yeah, the empty word is square free. Um, okay. So, I, I like better arbitrarily long. Okay, uh, yeah, right, right, right. Arbitrarily long. <laughs> Can we edit the video and, and write our screen? <laughs> okay, so this backtracking business um, is a little irritating in some ways. So, so I'll just mention that if you if you if you're avoiding cubes, for example, uh, you don't run into the same problem, and you can build an infinite word that avoids cubes. And so, so squares are just a special case. So in general, you can build infinite words that avoid patterns like this. Um, but the problem with backtracking is that you never know that the first that the terms you have are actually going to be correct in the limit because it's possible that you have to backtrack all the way to you know the third letter or something like that. So what's one way to get rid of backtracking completely? Um, it's one way. One thing we can do, and that's what I'm going to do, is use an infinite alphabet. So this is cheating, but you know, but this gets us out of sort of finite words and into some number theory. So let's still use squares. And now what happens is, okay, that still doesn't work. 0, 1 is fine. Uh, 0, 1 won't work here. But 0, 2 works fine. And then we can't put a 0 here, so this is a 1. We can put a zero here. We can't put a zero here because then we'll have zero, zero. We can't put a one here because then we'll have zero, one, zero, one. We can't put a two here because we'll have zero, one, zero, two, zero, one, zero, two. But we can put a three. So we never have to backtrack because there's always another letter we haven't used yet. And this is a very nice sequence. So if this is, let's, you know, again, index from zero. Sn is the p-adic valuation of n plus 1. So nu sub k of n is the, high, is the exponent of the highest power of k that divides n. Uh, so in other words, the nth term of the sequence is the exponent, is the, is the exponent of the highest power of 2. That divides n. So every, uh, yeah. So every, you know, we have to shift here. So so every odd index, every odd number, obviously, is not divisible by two at all. So that's why we get zeros here. Every number that's two mod four is divisible by two, but not four, etc. So it's, it's, this is a really nice sequence. Um, and it turns out that this sequence is too regular. So there's a, a linear recurrence that's, that this satisfies, and it is the following. S of 4n equals 0. S of 4n plus 1 equals S of 2n plus 1 minus S of n. S of 4n plus 2 is also 0. And S of 4n plus 3 is 2S 2n plus 1. And if you're interested in avoiding cubes, you get something very similar. Instead of the two attic valuation, of, and you get the three attic valuation. And for any integer power, it's just the k-adic valuation of n. The, highest, the exponent of the highest power of k that divides n gives you the sequence. Uh, and I should say, this, this was a remark. This wasn't the main point of this paper. Um, but this was a remark of uh, a paper by uh, Mathieu 
Kay Paquet, who was who is a graduate student at the University of Waterloo currently, and just shall it in 2009. So the, the, this paper was mostly about avoiding overlaps over the integers, um, but that's a different story. So if you're interested, I encourage you to go read the paper. It's kind of interesting. And you don't seem to get a k-regular sequence when you avoid overlaps. So what if you look at three half powers? So we know what happens for integer powers. Again, over the integers. What's a 3 half power? Well, it's a word of the form wvw, uh, where the length of w and v are the same. So, for, so every cube, for example, is, a, is also a 3 half power. So 0, 0, 0 is a 3 half power. But also 0, 1, 0 is a 3 half power. And another example. 1, 0, 0, 1. Now, this is sort of sloppy notation until you make it precise, but, but this means, you know, repeat the first half of the word at the end. So there's a fun one in English. <laughs> Decide is a three halves power. Is it possible to find all of them? In English? Yeah. 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 yeah, well, as long as you have a dictionary, yeah. sure. Yeah. Which is how I found that one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so what happens if you want the lexicographically least word on the integer, positive integer, non negative integers, say, avoiding three house powers? So again, we'll start with zero. We can put a zero here. We can't put a zero here because zero, zero, zero is a three house power. So we can put a one. Uh, we can't put a zero here because this is a three house power. So, so that has to be a 1. Um, we can put a 0 here. We can't put a 0 here because then this is a 3 halves power. So that has to be a 1. Oh, it can't be a 1 either because that's a 3 halves power. You know, and you can, if you're bored one day, you can just play this game with any pattern. And it's kind of fun. Uh, so, so, what do we say? So this has to be a 2. Okay, and this can't be a zero because that's a three halves power, so this has to be a one. Um, but then, because of this two, we're sort of we're sort of blocked off, in a sense, and so then we can put another zero. Let's see, I better do this carefully. Yeah, we can put two more zeros here. You know, it starts to become hard because you have you know again you have to look at the whole word, um, and then this. Has to, this can't be a zero because then we have a three house power here. But anyway, what you get is something that looks like this. So anyone anyone want to guess a pattern here? So it's important that this. It's, it's important, important, yeah. So in this case, we, we will, it looks like we'll use all of it. It's lexicographically smallest. Right. Otherwise, there are too many. Right. So it turns out that this block is, you know, so that these columns are constant, and these columns are also constant. And this column is periodic for period length 2. And so if this column were also periodic, then the whole thing would be periodic, and we'd have a sort of a nice structure theorem. It turns out not to be the case. Uh, this, this, is, this, is, this column is not periodic. Um, but there is a nice expression for it. And it's given by B of n. So this is the base 6 representation of n. So if the base 6 representation of n ends in a 0 or a 3 followed by some number of 5s, then it's 2 times the number of 5s plus 3. And if it's 1 or 4 with the number of 5s, then it's 2 and the number of 5s plus 4, etc. So this, this is bn, this column right here. I wonder if I wrote a few more terms down. It doesn't look like it. 
OK, so this is not an eventually periodic word. But, as you may have guessed, it is k regular for some k. And the k that it's k regular for, since everything is base 6 over here, 